Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and today we're going to dive right into Kickstarter for August 2019. There are a number of projects which are very popular actually in the solo community which have landed on Kickstarter or they're actually nearing their end. And I wanted to highlight and talk about a few of the ones that I'm most intrigued by. So without further ado, let's dive into the very first one. The very first Kickstarter that I want to talk about is, no surprise, it's Aetherfields, the board game from Awakened Realms. It's been extremely popular and also successful on Kickstarter thus far. Only 35 hours left to go, so when you guys actually watch this video, it'll be less than 24 hours. It's just over 29,000 backers, which is a crazy amount of individuals on board for this campaign. And in terms of pledge dollars, they have way past their goal. There's been lots of stretch goals unlocked throughout this campaign, and I was actually quite excited to be a part of this campaign in terms of showing you guys the prototype of uh, this actual game. And again, it's an earlier prototype even than what they're showing in this uh, in these graphics even. As you can see, for those that watched the Kickstarter preview, even the player boards are designed differently at this point compared to what we saw during the Kickstarter preview. Now, if this is the first time you are running into Etherfields. This is the very first video that's talking about it for you. Then you're going to want to check out my Kickstarter preview that will get into the weeds in terms of what the prototype had to offer us. And it will also give you a nice snapshot of what you can expect from the final game. Now, again, it's all prototype, so things will change and they're going to adapt and develop further as they go along through the Kickstarter as it ends and even afterwards. But that Kickstarter preview should give you a really good feel as to whether or not the game is for you or not. Whether it's uh, checking out the theme, the flow of the game, the mechanics, everything else. So, Why back now? Well, that's a good question. There's all this stuff. So if you want a whole bunch of stuff, you're going to get it. This game has all kinds of content. And the uh, original base game, at least from my understanding within this one, is 50 hours plus. Playing this one solo, in my opinion, might even be the best way to play this. Being that it's a game that you discover things as you go. Because... You truly only get to discover the things that you choose versus four other people at the table that are going to be uncovering things and doing things all at the same time. The game scales really well, as you can see during the Kickstarter preview that I did. Um, again, that'll be in the top right hand corner. Uh, there'll be an I and I'll have a link to that preview so you guys can check that out. But in that preview, you can see how the actual scaling works for solo and they've integrated it really nicely because the only there's only like one rule from the beginning which just essentially has you having additional turns going into scenes which is very easy to remember you'll never forget and also what's really nice is that in terms of the player count there's just one symbol icon currently in the prototype of a three-headed individual and when that's next to a number you simply just times the number that you see so if it's two by the number of players and that's essentially how much the check needs to be in order to succeed at it so it's really easy scales really well and there's no massive solo rules section to the rule book it's intuitive you can just start playing and that's one of the biggest things i liked about the game was just that there was no massive separate section for solo roles there's no ai bot there's none of this stuff you have to really just try to figure out it's just very intuitive you just kind of pick it up and go and you start having fun from the get-go that's a huge win because there's lots of games where you got to get past that barrier of rules learning and you really don't have to uh do that for the solo play solo side of things which i liked a lot so anyway, visual representation of the core box is all here. Tons of content, well beyond what I, you saw in the prototype if you watched the uh, play, playthrough that I did. There's multiple different pledge levels. The core box is the entry point, the, the lowest barrier of entry to get in. The core box and stretch goals included. And then things just start getting crazy from there. You can get ones that have the Creatures of Aetherfields miniatures. So it's about 20 unique miniatures. The major miniatures that come from probably the major plot points within the chapters of the game. So you can get that. That's probably the, you know, that's probably the cheapest version of a collector's version you can get in this one. But if you start going into wanting all of the content, in other words, you want everything that's going to give you more content to explore, more gameplay, then the Dream Master Pledge is where you want to be at. Because that's going to avoid all the add-ons that don't have anything centric to the actual gameplay. Uh, this is this is going to actually appease a lot of people that are like, I don't want all those miniatures, I don't want all those collectible things, I just want the content that's going to give me more hours. And if that's what you're after, this is the pledge for you as a Dream Master. 
You've got the Dream God, which is going to be the play mats, art books, sleeves, Sun Drop for all the models, which if you need to see what Sun Drop looks like, you can look at like Lord of Hellas. And it, honestly, if you want to look at the most recent one, it'd probably be Nemesis. That's probably the one in terms of quality that you want to check out if you're trying to determine whether Sun Drop's going to work for you, because Sun Drop has gone from being pretty uh, okay. It was okay to, to not okay in Lord of Hellas. Uh, to uh, much better in Nemesis. Like Nemesis' color schemes and stuff like that look really nice. Uh, they also added touches of blood and things like that uh, for the aliens. So they just kind of stepped their game up and the quality control on that sun drop got better as they did this more and more. So again, and the, and the sun drop's actually going to be available and it's available for Tainted Grail. Um, but again, if you're a painter, you're just going to want to do this all on your own. Uh, so... Really, you're going to expect to see breakdowns of every different pledge in here. So I'm not going to go through all this, but I will talk about some things to change that I just noticed even off the Kickstarter page. So if you if you watch my Kickstarter preview, the player boards do not look like this. And this is what's really cool about the development of the game is that as they go through the stages of development, they don't uh, let the community full-on change major gameplay elements uh, per se. I mean, you know, there's times where they might ask for some feedback, but typically the feedback that they're asking about in the Etherfields Facebook group uh, back they they throw this back at the community and they say here's a couple options uh you know as to the artistic style of what we could do for the player boards which one do you like and i really like that because it gives people not only during the kickstarter but even after the kickstarter some input on what the final version is going to be like this was very similar in tainted grail and previous projects and still shows the same you know care level for the backers that they had from the beginning, letting them actually change literally the look of the game. So this was actually a thing that was asked inside the Etherfields Facebook group was what type of player boards or design of player boards do you prefer? And at the end of the day, the people spoke. So it's cool to see them letting backers be a part of that because especially when art really is just to enhance the game. So it allows the masses to kind of guide particular pieces of that art or flair of the game uh not everything but some things and that's really really cool i like that a lot uh dream world so this is talking about the actual dream world itself you'll see in the prototype uh from my preview that this did not look like this the board does not have that particular piece of artwork on it but it does in the final version from what i can see here so maybe this is a really big story centric piece i did receive a miniature in the prototype that looked like this um, it was actually, I thought it was a first player marker, but maybe it actually speaks to something else in the story that I'm not aware of. Who knows? Again, this is a very mysterious game. Kind of hard to know all the angles when you're thrown into a snapshot in Chapter 3, not knowing what happened before or after it. Uh, we got all kinds of other stuff in this thing. We got uh, So you're going to see card size-wise, I, I forget what the actual size of these tiles are, but they are not standard size cards. They're, a little, they're, they're quite a bit bigger. They're, they're basically squares. Um, and then they've got standard cards too. But I just said that there's no idea what the size is, and then I'm also realizing how blind I am uh, as the size of the cards are right there on the screen. And that just shows you how tired I am. Okay, so moving on, we have uh, more cards. And that's essentially what you can expect in this game. Pretty much everything is cards and miniatures uh, in terms of content. Um, there are some miniatures you guys saw during the prototype, and there are some miniatures I received and I never saw during the gameplay. And that's another cool aspect. There's a lot of people asking, hey, how's re how replayable is this? And there's a lot, of, you know, anytime there's a narrative-driven game, you're going to have to understand that the narrative, the major story, it's kind of like playing Skyrim. The first time you play Skyrim, for most of us that have played that game or even least understand what Skyrim is, there is a main storyline that you can just choose to go straight through. It might take you 30 hours, may take you 20 hours, may take you 50 hours. You can go straight through that storyline and just call her quits and be done. But there's also all these side quests, all these side things just appear out of nowhere that just take you on bunny trails into nothingness and uh, add to the immersion factor of the game. And that's kind of the best comparison to what I feel like this game is doing. And some narrative games do it really well like that, giving you those different offshoots to explore. And some of them, you know, they kind of become dead ends or they're not really flushed out all that well. But even from the prototype alone, I found that after I played a particular scene, even though I knew what the objective was and I finished the objective, I still hadn't actually explored everything about that scene and there was something still nagging at me to come back and want to try 
to do those things. And there was even people on the video that were commenting saying, well, you didn't actually, in, you know, interact with this thing. And I really wanted to see how that was going to work. And you can just see from the proof right there that people are going like, ah, like that drives me crazy that I didn't get to see that one thing. Well, guess what that's going to cause? That's going to cause that person to go back and replay the game to, to experience that other side of the scenario. So you can expect, in my opinion, at least solo-wise, I could see myself playing this through once over for the main, and then the second time through with a different character, not only changing up the abilities, the masks, the deck building components, all that other stuff, and also just taking a second crack at it maybe uh, you know, in a different light, but you're also going to be able to try all the things that you never tried the first time through, and you technically also are a little bit smarter and wiser going into the next one as well. So that's, I can see this easily being a two times played type game. And then there's probably situations, even with two times played through on solo, where you're still going to miss a few things or the game's going to force you a certain way that you just can't do something you wanted to do. And it might cause you to replay again. But I would think that two times would make the most sense to me in terms of what I could expect out of it. Uh, these cardboard masks are crazy. They give you a ton of different... Um, abilities that are unique and uh, again i'm not 100 sure how these masks get introduced in the final version in the prototype that i actually played you just have a whole bunch to choose from that's not going to be the case in the final version you're going to earn these things as you go through so you're not just going to be able to go oh the ghost oh this one i just want to use it no it's it's not that easy you actually have to find them earn them and there'll be mechanics behind that and there'll be additional masks that aren't even shown in the prototype and all that good stuff. So it's going to be cool to see how these interact. And also it'll be interesting to see, like, are the masks just what they were shown in the prototype? Or is there more to them than what's being shown in the prototype? And I know that the prototype was a scaled down version of the intention of the game. So there could be more going on there than what they're actually letting on. Um... We got cardboard. We saw most of this stuff here, but there's actually keys you can get that are literally feel like keys, which are pretty cool. Tokens, plastic inserts, all the good stuff you expect from a typical Kickstarter in terms of components. The campaign. So this is a campaign included inside the core box, again, to just add more content. So if you're looking for sleeves, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to know exactly how many cards and what sizes. Uh, you can also pick up sleeves during the Kickstarter, too, if you want. And it giving you more and more cardboard uh, mass to pick from and find dream walker pledge they only talk about so they basically say like all the stuff from above plus the stretch goals unlocked but you get creatures of ether field so this is the 20 highly detailed miniatures i talked about above where uh, i had a couple of these i had four major ones and the librarian was one of them these other ones i have no idea what they are and they're obviously going to be major major entities within the world throughout the different chapters of the game as you play through it so you can actually click here to see the miniatures there's more of them there uh, the riddler expansion if i'm not uh mistaken this was an expansion that was unlocked based on the community's uh amazing efforts to unlock this puzzle piece by piece as they went through and this kind of like throws in a whole other little piece to the pie and actually if i'm looking at it correctly this is not completely unlocked yet so maybe this is the last one i believe they're throwing in as kind of the thank you at the end so this will probably be unlocked i thought it was but then i realized that the lock was locked uh, this will probably be cracked uh, for tomorrow, being it's the final day. And there's more details if you want to check that out here. <clears throat> so now that we get into the stretch goals, I'm not going to go through all these, but obviously upgrades, 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 tons of minis being added, stretch goal boxes, all kinds of stuff. They do a good job of actually detailing out how many hours roughly it's going to take to go through each of these campaigns. But uh, again, like I said, I think if you are picking up this game for the gameplay, you're like from what I can gauge from this, if you're talking the base game at 50 plus, the Harpy campaign at 30 plus, there's no way that this is not at least 100 plus hours of gameplay in the first run through. And then if you decide to come back, you're playing even more. Like I just, I, that's kind of where the replayability thing becomes moot point because if you're going to get that much play time out of something, you may not need to come back. Like, you already soaked enough time into the game. It's kind of like I said with the analogy with Skyrim. It's like, yeah, you could come back and do a bunch of things a different way than you did them before. But you know what? Sometimes just soaking all your time into that first run through is good enough. You're getting your money's worth, uh, you know, over and over again. So you can see here, there's 
literally more expansions that add another 30 hours of gameplay or the funeral witch campaign that adds even more content it's just like if you really want to go down the rabbit hole with this thing you can and it's cool that they actually added a fifth player expansion i believe the community was actually driving this one so they wanted to actually allow another person to kind of come in uh so i'm not actually as familiar with how this one came to pass but it's very cool um the reaper oh it's gonna have a transform i actually wasn't familiar with this one at all add-ons so we got the thorn knight somebody's come with cards specific and then miniatures wow that's kind of cool actually didn't know that either art book metal keys play mat that i that i like I, I think for a game where you're gonna be playing with cards non-stop and add on like a play mat makes perfect sense i i would be all i'm gonna be all over this one um playing cards i saw this actually for i think it was the preview for the game itself card sleeves and everything else so card holders that i had no idea was even a thing uh, i missed this completely during the playthrough so that's actually really or during the campaign this is really cool actually very thematic looking and also extremely creepy <laughs> um yeah so again it was really cool to kind of be able to throw my thoughts in there i do truly believe my statement there that i do think this is an immersive experience i really think it it that idea that the game is a constant state of discovery in the unknown, it does keep you glued to the table. I was playing the, the prototype, and every time I finished a part, and I was waiting for your guys' opinions on what we should do next, I was gunning to start the next one, and it was tough to even wait a day or two to start filming the next part, because I wanted so badly to see how that scene would end, or what, I, what was going to happen when I interacted with certain things. Once you get going, I feel like this is one of those games where you are going to see the hours tick by and not realize how much you've played. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's something that's like very rare um, in board games, especially uh, when you're typically looking at the clock. I didn't find myself doing that during this uh, playthrough. So, And then there's all kinds of other great resources out there as well from different angles if you need to check it out uh, listed on the Kickstarter page. But that's pretty much it. I mean... I have covered Etherfields quite extensively, and hopefully during this kind of run through here in the segment here, you get a little additional pieces of thoughts from me as well. And uh, I think that's going to pretty much wrap this one up. Again, if you have no idea what to do uh, in terms of pledge level, if you're very unsure as to whether or not the game's for you, I really hope that the Kickstarter preview I put together helps you in that decision. And uh, remember that you can always even pledge at a dollar just to get access to the pledge manager if you need additional time to hum and haw over this. If I'm not mistaken, if I take a look here at the... Yeah, you can just pledge one GP. Uh, you, can, you can just pledge one and still have access to the pledge manager. Obviously, the more people that pledge, knowing that they want it right away the stretch goals will unlock. They'll unlock more and more, right? So we know that's, we know this is the typical logic for Kickstarter. But if you're one of those people that's on the fence, a dollar will get you access to something later on that you can then upgrade later on when you're 100% sure what you want. That might be the route for you if you're really on the fence. So that's going to do it. Let's move to the second Kickstarter project I like to talk about. The next project I want to talk about is called Sleeping Gods, and this actually landed today, the day that I'm actually recording this, and uh, there's, so there's quite a bit of time left to actually jump on this train if you're interested. Now, I don't have anything on the channel that's going to go into any depth in terms of Sleeping Gods, but I am a really big fan of Ryan Lockett's work. He is a not only the graphic designer behind his games, but also the creator and designer of the game itself. Um, so that's really cool. He also has individuals uh, with him as well, but he's the primary individual. Uh, Sleeping Gods is one that has been, been a lot of people have been waiting for this to land for a long time because, again, it's one of those epic, immersive, open-world storybook games that he's so well-known for. But uh, this is going to be one that I really think, from a solo gaming perspective, is going to be interesting because things like Near and Far and Above and Below were not designed as solo playable games, although Near and Far got a solo or co-op variant essentially within a Kickstarter for Amber Minds that allowed it to become kind of solo playable. And it's really cool for the first time seeing a game from him, if I'm not mistaken, at least one in terms of the, you know, following the path of Above and Below and Near and Far, one from him that actually is solo playable right from the get-go. <clears throat> so that's very exciting. And a reason why I am kind of uh, on, well, I'm not even kind of thinking about this one. This one is a huge, huge uh, recommendation from me. Uh, now, personally, I just like the art style and the sense of adventure that he puts into his games. 
and they also all to seem to follow a similar note. So if you if you like his previous work, he's one of those individuals that creates games that always seem to have a tie back in terms of not only the artwork, the gameplay, whatever, to his previous work. So he's he's moving forward and trying different things, but also kind of tying back to his previous work. And that's what's really cool, because if you are a fan of his uh, previous games, then you are likely going to like the next iteration of his stuff, as he doesn't, or at least he hasn't yet, uh, really rock the boat on the uh, on his um, mentality of design, essentially. Uh, but it's actually a good thing, because what he produces is insanely high-quality games. <laughs> So I really, really am interested in this one for sure. So you can see here, it's a 10 to 20 hour campaign. You're kind of exploring. And this is another thing that I need to make mention of in case you guys aren't aware. It's not a it's not a board that you're exploring. You'll notice here, this is actually a coiled binder. So basically as you play through the game, of course there's all kinds of cards involved and everything, but there's actually a coiled book. And as you explore from area to area within Sleeping Gods, you're going to be flipping pages, which then open up new maps. You can explore different places you can go. So that's something that I really liked. I really liked the idea of just opening up a book and having the book be the actual map you play on. I thought that was always really cool with his stuff. Again, this was introduced in previous entries of his games. It's not a new thing, but if this is the first time you're ever hearing of a Ryan Locke game, this is a staple in his stuff. He's also got uh, breakdowns here for all the different little pieces coming within the game. He's got a 136 page storybook. His story writing is great, so you're not going to be lacking there. Uh, I didn't actually know that there was an expansion as part of this, so that's really cool. It's awesome that he's adding that in. So an eight page atlas of additional stuff going on there. So that's pretty awesome. You can get yourself some coins that are that are oh man, max journal, 40 pages of lore. So wow, that's kind of cool too. Flexible battle map, double sided, a soundtrack. Now that's cool. So again, like I love stuff that just draws you in in terms of an immersive experience with the game. Um, things like Joan of Arc, for instance, recently landed for me and they had a soundtrack associated with that. Uh, I just love games that go that extra mile to make the feel you know the game more immersive and stuff like that and, and i i do this even when games don't have soundtracks i almost always with friends have something some kind of music playing that actually matches the game it's something i very much think needs to happen because it really adds a whole other level of uh immersion to the experience and there's some videos for it too if you need to check it out uh, in terms of whether or not you back it. But yeah, this is one that I would highly recommend. Based on my own personal purchases of Above and Below and Near and Far and the enjoyment that I've had with those ones, I can say that Sleeping Gods, without a doubt, is going to be a successful uh, and, and, and very fun game without even playing it. I just know because of his previous work lining up so closely in terms of its design. So... Definitely check this one out, and uh, the video will also give you more information as to whether or not this is something you like, but uh, a high recommendation for me from the solo side of things. Now, what I would like to do before I close off here, aha, there it is, and I want to prove to you guys that you're wondering if it's solo playable. It officially is out of the box. The next one I want to talk about is another epic fantasy world adventure. This one's coming from Simon Games, Trudvang Legends. Now, this game is based on a role-playing game of which I have no experience whatsoever. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. So the bad thing is I don't understand the lore to this game at all. Uh, I would need to do some reading in order to understand that. So for that, I have sinned. Uh, for those individuals that know about the role-playing game, well, then you already have a leg up on me in terms of knowledge already. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the game itself here on Kickstarter. But what's really cool is that they're not creating something that has nothing behind it. Uh, so that's something I like, even though I don't understand it personally in terms of its background. I like the fact that it's entrenching itself in something that the community does actually have a foothold in. And, uh, and can use as a place to uh, to find lore and, and understanding of what's going on in that game world. So it feels like more of a world that pre-exists to the game itself versus something that's trying to create a world that may not exist at all. That makes sense. So I do like that. Uh, and it is a successful campaign. Uh, it was looking for a $200,000 goal. It's got 10,000 backers and plus seven more days to go. Uh, I believe I saw an announcement from Simon recently saying that every single day they're going to unlock a stretch goal regardless of the dollars coming in. So I thought that was kind of a nice 
change because I believe CMON recently had gone to a to a to a thing where if it was only you know it was by dollars that that's what generated the stretch goals. But now they're going to say no, there'll be additional stretch goals as well per day. So it just kind of increases the excitement uh, in the campaigns, and I really think that this is one thing that I would say in terms of advice for them is that they did used to do a really good job back in the day of having stretch goals be a very being a very uh, heavily involved thing with Kickstarter in terms of it being, uh, you know, the intervals for each stretch goal were much lower uh, and the amount of them were much higher. And I find, uh, you know, last year and things like that, some of that stuff died down quite a bit um, and those intervals became larger and they were slower. And I think the excitement of the campaign kind of slows to a crawl when when it's trying to churn to the next stretch goal. So them introducing something where they're giving something back, no matter what, all the time, always generates interest. It also brings people back to the Kickstarter page every day to actually check it out and see what they got for free, essentially for pledging, which is another way to generate more interest in the project. So that's a smart marketing tool for sure. Um, so with this one, like this one intrigues me. I, I will say that 100%. Uh, there was uh, the Bloodborne project that they put together prior again was another one another ip that i needed i should have played that game um for whatever reason i never got around to playing bloodborne so i didn't have the draw to pick that one up personally because i just don't know the background of the bloodborne ip at all um i didn't have a playstation at the time i still don't have one uh to actually uh you know enjoy that and try to figure out what that's all about but i do know that it's a beloved uh, uh ip and and i can understand the individuals that want to pick that up but I, so i passed on that last one from simon because of that if i don't understand the ip enough then i typically will shy away from it because i've already got enough content to uh, actually work through myself with my pledges that i do than to be adding something that i don't even understand the background of on top of it but this one intrigues me because it's more of an adventure fantasy game that has a story that is going to be, yes, based in the lore that comes from an RPG, but also standalone in that you don't need to know it to enjoy it. So that's kind of where, and Bloodborne falls into that too. I, I could have easily applied the same logic there, but I think at the end of the day, this one pulls me a little bit more in terms of its gameplay, I think, than, than Bloodborne did. So there's there's lots going on here. It's a typical Simon production in terms of the miniatures. They're going to be off the charts. They're going to be beautiful and they're going to be wild. Um, there's lots of stories involved with this one, being that it's coming from an RPG background. Um, but there's some really unique mechanics being built in this game that I saw that was really interesting. I want to talk about. So there's other things here. You can see the wildlands, something that they're slowly progressing towards unlocking. There's the unlocking content every day, as I mentioned. So I'll show you what I was talking about once we get past the stretch goal list here, of which there's a whole bunch of stuff. They're currently all the way down here to the troll. There's a bunch of other things to unlock. So optional buys, all kinds of other content. They've got Dark Woods, the Westmark. The, like, so again, if you're looking for content, you're not going to be lacking here. There's all kinds of boxes to pick up. Uh, what I wanted to find was this, the map board. This is what intrigued me. This is the first thing about this game that made me go, hmm, that's different. And and I like it. And it kind of has this like legacy aspect built into the game. And how this works essentially, from what I understand from a high level without actually ever playing it, is that these are all actual card sleeves essentially or slots. And maybe slots is a better way to say it. On the game board that's foldable. So... You can see that there's a fold between into four kind of quadrants and so the lines actually sit in between all of those different spaces but there's different areas in the game world that will sit a, a kind of almost um in a way this is almost reminiscent uh in a way but not exact the tainted grail kind of in terms of some of the things i did during my kickstarter preview where like i would you know interact with the village and the village was there and then something terrible would happen. The village would like get burned down or blow up or something. Someone would attack it. It would be, go under siege and it would be on fire. And in Tainted Grail, you take a card and you place it on top of the card that had the village on it. And now it's a flaming inferno. And it just kind of gave you that sense that the game world was changing as you did things or impacted that game world. So the state of the game changed. Now with Tainted Grill, you kind of had to manage the cards on the table, and it's totally different than this, so I'm not full-on comparing apples to apples there because it's really not that type of comparison. But that's the only thing that I could think of off the top of my head that was close. 
With this one, what they're doing is you're slotting a card in a sleeve on the game board, so that right away is very different. Um, and it also means that this could potentially change multiple times and not just once over. It might be something where, like, a, you know, might put a card in a sleeve up here to represent a certain event or something happening here, and later on another card goes in that changes it, maybe another card goes in. But again, it's all based on what your, you know, maybe your footprint in the world is, is, is impacting these different areas. So what's really cool is when you're done with the game, you fold this board up and all the cards stay in place. And then when you're ready to play the game next time, you simply unfold the map board and boom, you've got your game state saved. That in and of itself is awesome. I love that. And when I saw that, I was like, that is very cool. Not only are you adding a legacy element to the game, but you're also keeping it manageable and storable and everything. It goes right back in the box and it's all neat and tidy. The cards themselves are actually protected like perfect it's a, it's a great idea so kudos to them for putting that together because i actually really like that so you can see here lore cards now i don't know which of these actual cards end up in those slots because i need to watch more videos on this myself but that was the uh what i got the gist of from the first couple videos anyway so here we go yes yeah, so this is exactly an explanation of what i just said so it remembers your actions so you put you know a slide a card in and sleeves on the map board hold cards to keep track of how the story unfolds revealing challenges Blah, blah, blah. So I pretty much summed that already up and you got different choices in the game that are then are going to be flipped and used and in, in altering the, the game itself. So you can see the miniatures kind of moving around to different areas. You're discovering different things. So again, it's an epic adventure and it's based in an RPG world that even if you don't understand, I could still see the draw here uh, to check this out. So I'm very, very interested in this one. Um, originally, I wasn't. And then my mind changed very quickly after seeing some of these videos. I was very, very interested. In it. So this is one that I think for solo gaming could be could be a hit um, in terms of exploration and everything else. But it does fall into the bucket of being a Simon production with many miniatures. It also falls in the bucket of being a fantasy game, of which there are tons of them already. So the question really becomes, is this going to be... Oh, that's really cool. See, that's the thing, too. Like the more I go through this, I'm like, here's here's additional boards so it's not just the board in the main game and sorry that was a squirrel moment there but essentially there's literally like different boards that look completely different for each of the expansions like this one here has you going from like underneath the earth's crust inside the caves like so there's a lot of cool stuff that you know you're going to discover as you go through here you got the art book so anyway, long story short, I'm very intrigued. I went from being eh to being on board uh, quite quickly after seeing some of the content for this thing. So this is one that I would re recommend checking out uh, because it might fit in your collection in terms of filling a void of something that you don't already have. Um, but again, it's solo playable out of the box. You're not going to have to worry about, uh, you know, having to have, uh, you know, friends around in order to enjoy this. It is one to four players. It takes about 60 minutes per chapter. So that is going to wrap up Broadbang Legends. The next Kickstarter I want to talk about is Dice Throne Adventures and Season 1 Rerolled. And you can see right from the top here, this is why I was drawn to this project, a cooperative and solo campaign inspired by Diablo with exploration, gold, treasure upgrades, minions, and epic boss battles. If this is anything like Diablo in terms of how it plays, I'm already going to be in big trouble because I love Diablo. So if it's following that type of inspiration... I'm going to like this game. Now, I have seen this one come through Kickstarter before, and I didn't jump on it. Uh, but, but I do see it now. And I have also heard from many individuals who have played this that said it is worth looking into. And now they're re-rolling this first content, from my understanding, the season one being re-rolled. Now I'm even more intrigued at finding out more about this game. So... I'd recommend that solo players take a look at this, being it the cooperative and solo aspect is right in there from the get-go. If you have played Dice Throne before, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it, and maybe even what you think more so about this current Kickstarter, because Dice Throne is out there in the wild already, but this is going to add and change some things from my understanding. Um, but I am interested in this. But again, anything I recommend here during this uh, particular video is just me kind of being excited about particular projects. You should always, always do your research on all the different projects here on Kickstarter uh, to make sure that the games fit for you. But I am just trying to highlight ones that have solo play and I, and I know uh, for myself are going to come to fruition. Uh, things that I believe uh, have a strong 
uh, and very, very strong uh, chance to actually uh, produce and not turn into a situation where people are out money with no game in hand. There's nothing that anybody wants to see. So you can see here, you can get the champion battle box for 22 bucks. You can get Dice Throne Adventures Champion Edition for 69 with some minis in there as well. If you happen to throw in some extra stuff. Season 1 Reroll Battle Chest, $79. The latest loot bundle, $132. Now, I'm going to have to take it. So, gameplay only. Ah, so there's your gameplay only bundle. If you just want all this stuff again that has nothing to do with the minis, then that's going to be the one you want. Pledge level 210 for Epic Collector, exactly the same as the Collector below. Includes unpainted, so unpainted miniatures instead of pre-painted ones. So there's a difference there. Having painted miniatures though is pretty awesome. Of course, that adds to the uh, that certainly adds to the immersion factor when they look good. Legendary Collector unpainted. I I do like. I don't know, there's something about the actual gameplay, just even just looking at some of these videos that I can see that Diablo-style thing kind of coming through a little bit here. That's cool. Earn treasure chests with randomly generated content through an innovative and addictive system that was heavily inspired by Diablo. Very cool, very cool. Ah, oh, how did I miss this the first time around? Geek and Sundry's got a video for this. I, yeah, that's awesome. And finally, after two years, Season 1 reroll, there are some brand new... That's good. That's all. So I mean, it might be the perfect time to actually kind of get me back into this thing, seeing as they're re-rolling the original. So that's interesting. The artwork in the game is phenomenal looking. The dice look fantastic. Um, I'm more and more intrigued the more I look at this page. I can tell you right now, the artwork alone is look awesome. The dice is really cool. Or they're so unique looking. It looks like some of these kind of have like that marble look inside of them as well. Very nice. Oh, there's a print and play. So you want to try it, you can actually give it a shot through print and play. So that's handy. You got all these different things that you can add in. Gameplay only bundle, the epic collector bundle. You've got play mats and all kinds of insanity. That's there's so much stuff there. That's wild. The legendary collector bundle. Wow, that's so like when you see it visually, you start to realize how much stuff you're actually getting for the dollar value, but it's pretty pretty wild. Okay, so all I'm gonna say about this one is I haven't actually played this myself. I have heard good things. This is one you're gonna to want to do your research on. I do love the fact there's neoprene mats in here, and like literally, if you're looking to get in on this game, this is gonna be the time. I can't remember off the top of my head whether or not this is ending really soon or not, but I think it is. Yeah, 47 hours to go. So by the time you guys, this is going to be very similar to Etherfields. By the time you guys are watching this video, there's going to be less than a day left. So this is one I, I think you guys should actually check out at this point in time. And again, this might be one that allows dollar pledges. So if you're checking out this video and you're going, oh man, I have no idea if I really want to uh, get in on this or not, and I need to do some more research, um, you can see here the solo mode, it's being tested and in development. We don't expect to have many more details about it during the campaign. So it's going to be included. They are working on it. They did. So that's kind of one downside is they didn't, they weren't able to specify too much information during the campaign about the solo mode. But the fact that they're doing it um, is, is a good thing. Um, and it will be part of the main game once it's actually done. I don't see, I'm just looking to see if you can actually pledge for a dollar. And, oh, here we go. So if you pledge at least $22 for the ninja level, you have the option to upgrade. So there you go. You have to pledge at least at this. They're not going to do the uh, $1 pledge. So, oh, they're not going to allow you to get the Kickstarter pricing in exchange for a $1 pledge. So that's that's interesting. So yes, you can pledge a dollar, but whatever pricing shows up in the PM will not be as good as what they're showing on the Kickstarter currently if you pledge a dollar. If you pledge $22, which is the lowest level on the campaign right now, this one right here, then you can at least upgrade to any of these other ones at the discounted Kickstarter price uh, rate uh, afterwards, whereas these prices may increase in the PM otherwise. So that's some good information to keep you aware of. So that's going to be it for Dice Drone Adventures. This is one I highly recommend looking into. I personally am going to dive into this a little bit more because I really think this could actually be quite a bot. This could actually be a lot of fun in a solo capacity if this is done well.
The next Kickstarter project I want to highlight is Dinogenics, Controlled Chaos and Second Printing. So this is the second time this has actually come back to Kickstarter. Now this one's not going to retail because there's a lot of expensive components that actually go into this particular production from the FAQ here on the Kickstarter page. They mention exactly that. So if you're looking to pick this game up, you're going to want to do it on Kickstarter. Again, another project that I'm giving you at the very last second. 36 hours to go by the time you watch the video there's probably less than a day easily uh, this is a very successful project as well and uh, this comes from ninth haven games so if you want to find out more about the game i'll ask you to check out the kickstarter page because it does a good job of breaking down all the different pledge levels that you can dive into for this particular one um, in terms of access to the pledge manager this one if you just pledge for a dollar will give you access to the pledge manager so that you're able to make a decision later on if you're not sure that's always a good idea, but the one thing about this is that that's not always the case with every project, so you always want to check the FAQ to determine if that is actually a thing. Uh, and as you noticed in the last Kickstarter, it's a thing, but it comes sometimes with a Kickstarter price adjustment there um, if you're uh, not at a certain pledge level. So sometimes it's just a dollar to still access the Kickstarter costs at the cheapest, or the times you can actually miss out on those good prices if you do a dollar. So good to do your research on that. It also shows you, now you're also going to look at this and go, this looks very familiar. It looks like Dinosaur Island. Well, these two games actually were very much competing against each other, but they do different things. And it's not really worth going to the weeds on how these things are different, but they're different. Uh, they, they play this whole dinosaur game very differently. And if you want to find out how differently, then you're going to want to check out some videos for those. I don't have any playthroughs on my channel currently. But I can re recommend this from a solo side of things for sure. This is an interesting game. It's a fun game. If you're into dinosaurs, you're into creating a park, if you're in interested in messing around with the DNA of these dinosaurs and all this kind of stuff, you get all this stuff going on with this game. It's a very um, well-presented production as well, uh, which is also nice. There's new species being introduced in this. You can see giant sharks. So if you're a fan of sharks, you're going to want to go after this right away. Um, again, I love the way that the uh, the area is kind of built up with this worker placement thing going on. You got the different animals and the different pens. They're all you know they're all visually shown with an actual dinosaur itself, which is really awesome. So you can see here, like it's just it's just looks cool. They got the walls up everywhere and stuff. Um, so we'll just keep on moving through here because it's not only just for Dinogenics itself, which comes with all this extra content here, also has a new and the rule book is here too. There's an expansion, I believe, that they haven't broken out in this yet unless I passed it. But you can take a look at the rule book here because the game has been printed out once already. The pre-release version of Control Chaos, that's the expansion. So you can check out the rule book there. So that's great. You can see both those things right away. You've got reviews from the original game itself. So if you want to find out videos, you're not going to be lacking in that department. And you can even try it before you buy it. You can go to Steam and Dinogenics is there. You could actually give this a, a chance on... Uh, uh, within tabletop um, simulator if I'm not yeah tabletop simulator will allow you to to play this which is awesome so another way to get the mod and check it out there so you can see two additional solo player scenarios so so there's going to be solo specific content that's already been broken out again yes it's part of you can see again more solo scenarios these are broken out as part of stretch goals sometimes I'm not really a fan of that but this is a reprint of the original game so it's going to be adding more to what they had in that original one so that's really cool to see so sometimes i usually would say if this was the original iteration of a game i'd say hey stretch goals was solo and not so much of a fan but this is actually an enhancement of the original game which already had solo so it's adding more solo stuff to the game which is a good thing uh, you got add-ons here if you want to get coins to get things fancy in your presentation first printing upgrade you can upgrade some things that changed uh, you've got your meeple sets. That's kind of cool. You get some really specific ones. Corrupted T-Rex meeple sets. Yikes, that looks really creepy. I'm guessing that's when DNA just goes sideways on you. Um, that's pretty much it. So this is one that I would definitely recommend checking out and uh, doing your research on. I think for people that are in, uh, interested in kind of managing a dinosaur park, uh, this is definitely going to be up your alley. So uh, that is going to be all for Dinogenics. 
And last but certainly not least is Hexplore at the Sands of Shirax. And this one I'm really excited about because this is the third volume of Hexplore. That's right, way back when the channel first originally started, Hexplore was one of the original playthroughs that we did. And if you actually go check that out, you can certainly see how the state of the channel has evolved over time. Uh, as I was not as good at presenting things way back then, but that playthrough is actually one of the most uh, enjoyable experiences that I had with the community in terms of the back and forth of what we should do next and all the different uh, exploration involved. And that was with the original Hexplore box, which there has been more content come out for this game in the last while. Um, there has been a uh, kind of a return to the Valley of the Dead King, which is the first iteration or first volume. Um, and then there's also the Forests of Adramon, which was the second volume and a returning to, you know, expansion that basically returned back to that volume too. And now we have the third volume, uh, The Sands of Shirax. And this one just started on Kickstarter within a couple days ago. Uh, it's already successfully funded. And I can tell you right now, they're not just maintaining status quo on this one in terms of the mechanics within each of these iterations or volumes. Every time they put out another volume of this game, the mechanics and the actual gameplay change or actually get better as it goes along, which is really cool to see. You are able, if you want, to mix and match all these volumes together, but they are typically played separately as different experiences, and they really are, in essence, a role-playing game in a box. So it says here, enter the waste to rich or to explore a rich world caught in turmoil, build heroes, power them up, and face hundreds of challenging scenarios. So we can see you've got over a thousand backers 25 days ago, 150,000 Canadians, so just over a hundred thousand in terms of US dollars. And uh, this is going to give you a good indication right from the get-go that a lot of people can play this, and you can play this solo, and I've proven that uh, from the get-go back when they created their original projects. So uh, Jonathan is the creator of this particular game, and the art and presentation of this game is off the charts. They do a phenomenal job of the artwork for each of the different characters. Again, remember, this is very, very much a role-playing board game, and it's like... The closest thing you are going to get to an RPG experience is this. Um, that is, in terms of a board game, uh, this is really, really driving that home. Uh, you're going to literally have erasable uh, sheets that you're going to use, which I will move to here in a second. You got the world you're exploring to, core box. We're going to run to a spot here where it shows. Here we go. So this is where it's actually talking with the different types of cards or different characters that you can be within this world, and that's where the combinations really come into play and get wild for this you can in the original couple boxes i think the combination total was and it might even be including this one on this kickstarter might mention it i think it's in around the 800 mark so around 800 different variations of characters you can potentially create by mixing and matching these things so there's essentially races involved there's traits involved there's the actual character you want to be so you can be the gladiator that happens to be an orc that happens to do something like you can just you can you can combo so many different unique um abilities and things like that this is where the role playing element really comes into play and the way they handle it is perfect for a board game they have an erase like as i mentioned they have an erasable um dry erase board for your player board that you can actually write the stat numbers in and you're tracking the different uh, stats along the way and the cost of upgrading those stats and then when you don't need them anymore you just erase them and change them so you don't have to worry about having tokens and everything all over the place which is i love the modular map is also fantastic because every single time you play the game it's going to change the whole out outline of the world and uh, where things are you're going to have to explore things differently to try to find different regions and that's going to obviously impact uh, the encounters that you run into and stuff like that, giving you the replayability off the charts. Uh, new bosses. So you got some major bosses within the story that you're going to have to fight up against. And of course, they're going to scale based on player counts and everything else. Um, I played against a couple of ones from the Valley of the Dead King. And some of them are pretty insane in terms of needing to, to use some serious strategy to take them down. I really, truly enjoyed it. And uh also, of course, tons of cards because the game's going to come with all kinds of cards. Reaper miniatures are the ones that are actually behind the miniatures in the game, which is cool. You can see that you can increase the size of the waist with the extenders by putting them. Well, that's kind of interesting. So you can actually you can actually change up the way the maps are created in and of itself. The bars are now double sided. That's cool. So they're, again, this is where I'm saying like they're taking they're taking uh, 
game design choices from the original ones and building off of those to add more options for you. You got new roll unlocks here. It's a look of the prototype. Stretch goals, so heavier cards, placards, punch boards, group minis. This is what's really cool too. They've already, it looks like, I think, we've unlocked the return to the Sands of Shrek. So this is the, uh, essentially every single major volume, which is, uh, you know, gets a return to. And the return to just adds even more content on top of what's already there. So you're going to get like more hero traits. You're going to get more dry erase placards, uh, new roles, bosses, you're going to get uh, dice added in, more cards. Of course, it's going to change all the different, uh, you know, again, this just jumps the replayability of that particular volume. To heights. This is all the kind of stuff you get to throw in there. So if you've never heard of Hexport before, this is one that I really feel flies under the radar. And I really think that solo players need to take a look at this because this is a game that does things differently than anything else in my entire collection. As I mentioned before, this is the closest to getting a role-playing game experience in a complete and compact time frame. Because typically role-playing games uh, require multiple sessions of large amounts of time to complete. This gives you that in a much more condensed package, and I love that. Um, I actually recently unboxed the most recent Volume 2 version on the channel. So if you want to check that out, uh, you can also find that on the channel. Plus, again, if you haven't seen the uh, playthrough that I did, I'll also have that linked up in the eye in the top, uh, top, top right-hand corner of this video. So you can go uh, check it out because it will definitely give you an idea as to how this thing plays. And uh, it looks like... Are they actually moving towards another one here? Let's see. You can go through the entire game. Huh, so volume, okay, so they're going to another volume here, I guess. That's kind of crazy. So they got more stuff coming down the pipes as well. Okay, so they're actually breaking out the different familiar location uh, mechanics from the previous volumes and then the new things they've added. So that's really interesting. These are going to be all the different things you can do now that you couldn't do in the last one. Um, game locations, I don't know. I just love the presentation of this one. It's so well done. They have videos for every single one. The designers actually put together some videos. Um, and some close-ups here of some of the different locations oh, are a part of things. So it's always interesting seeing these different types of mechanics added into a game that you were familiar with and now seeing brand new stuff that you have to try to get your head wrapped around. But uh, I really enjoyed it. And you got the rule book here. So if you want to see how the game actually works, you're going to be able to just click, click on that. You can read that. Oh, yeah, that's right. There's a beta. I forgot about that. There's a companion app coming during the campaign for the existing content uh, for backers that already picked up previous entries. So that's going to be huge. And uh, here's a look essentially at the reprint. So I guess if the actual Kickstarter does successful amounts of uh, dollars, which I'm not sure what it needs to actually unlock these, then you'll be able to actually pick up the Valley of the Dead King. You get the Forest of Adramon. So these are the three major volumes. And then each one of them has the return to, as I mentioned, right? So this one right now just focuses on the third volume, but could potentially reprint everything else. Here we go. This is what I was talking about earlier. So it says just how many hero combinations are there in the Hexboard series? There's 39 races, or sorry, 39 rolls and 50 races for a total of, oh, it's, oh, it's way more than 800. Oh, because there's traits involved as well. 131,000? I had no idea that it was that high. Okay, so I was off by a substantial margin on my guess there because I must have seen this first thing when it was first calculating, but it wasn't fully complete. But you can just see the insanity in terms of the customization of your character is off the charts. Um, so that's really cool. And they got add-ons here too if you want more dice or fancy bags or extra cards to kind of flush out more replayability within the card decks in the game. So... What I really want to announce during this particular video is that I enjoyed playing through the very first tech sport so much that I'm actually going to be announcing right now that the next uh, Kickstarter preview that's going to be happening on Rolling Solo is going to be for Hexport at the Sands of Chirax. That's right. We're going to go right back to Hexport again uh, for the second time. We're going to be going into an adventure. So if you are curious about how this game works, I will be starting a uh, kickstarter preview of this later this week and uh, the beginning of next week and we'll be going through the time frame of this particular kickstarter releasing videos and it may end sometime afterwards 
Uh, but I'm looking to give you guys a good look at the prototype version of this particular game to see whether or not this is something that uh, that you might want to pick up and hopefully be able to make an informed decision on. So that is going to end rolling on Kickstarter. We're going to end it off with that announcement. So if you actually stuck it out from the very beginning all the way to the end, then you get that insider information in terms of what's coming down the pipes next. Uh, but other than that, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, do your research on every Kickstarter project, no matter what I've shown you here or, or what I haven't shown you. And also in the comments, let me know below, do you see any or have you run into any other solo projects on Kickstarter that you were truly interested in that I didn't highlight in this video that you wanted to make mention of? That would be fantastic because we all find projects that we're interested in for different varying reasons. And it'd be fantastic to hear some of the ones that you that have caught your eye as well. So thank you guys so much. And as always, keep on rolling solo.